I'm the only person in that room, so. <laughs> I'd like to have a photo of it. Anywho, thank you so much for having me today. So, uh, my name is Daniel Archer. Um, I am I'm humbled to be here. I just want to let you guys know. It was a privilege to be asked to come here today. And uh, I started writing this talk, if you will, about, about a year ago. Um, in, in the hopes that someday I'll be able to, to regurgitate it in front of uh, uh, you men here. So, once again, thank you for this opportunity. And, uh, it's an honor. First off, I want to apologize to uh, any of you that have known me or heard stories or regurgitated from me before. A really good friend of mine once told me, after I had not seen him for quite some time, and I started spinning a yarn that he had already heard, and he said, hey man, you should probably just number your stories. You can walk in and go, hey Fred, number 27, we'll acknowledge it and we'll move on with life. Um, so hopefully that's not one of those days for uh, those of you that know me. I was asked to tell you about a few times in my life when I faced obstacles and diversity and how I overcame them. So today I wish to share with you not only not to celebrate your diversities, but to embrace them and use them. I've been blessed by our Creator and have experienced some amazing things in my life. Most of them I can say happened before I joined the Army. And a lot of you know that uh, I don't shy away from a good uh, story about being in the military and I'm not here to sell the service, uh, but I never shy away from talking about the opportunities that uh, people may have by serving our nation. When asked to spend this morning with you, I must have felt like Mark Twain did back in 1882 when he was asked to speak to some youth. He said, uh, being told I was expected to talk here, I inquired what sort of talk I ought to make. They said it be something suitable youth, uh, to youth, something didactic, instructive, or something uh, good nature and advice. Very well. I have a few things in my mind that I have longed to say for instruction for the young. It is in one's tender years that such things will best take root and most enduring and most favorable. First, then, I say to you, my friends, and I say beseechingly and urgently. Now, this is some advice that Mark Twain gave 133 years ago, so I apologize to maybe some of the uh, adults in here and how credible it just may be. Number one, always obey your parents when they're around. Number two, be respectful to your superiors and strangers, and often time to others. Number three, go to bed early, get up early, for this is wise. Number four, now as a matter of lying, you want to be very careful about lying, otherwise, you're sure to get caught. Number five, probably a little more prominent in the country here, never handle firearms carelessly. Number six, there are many sort of books, but the good ones are short for the young to read, remember that. Now as for myself, I give you this disclaimer before I start disseminating what some may consider advice. You have to be tough when you're dumb, and I've become pretty tough over the years. <laughs> I face challenges in life from the physically daunting to the intellectual kind and even the emotional kind. Where currently, as I began writing this, I was on an unexpected uh, Southwest Airlines flight to Boise, Idaho to attend a fellow comrade's funeral who unexpectedly died in an Apache Longbow helicopter crash on November 7th of last year. I tell my children when they're riding bikes that you can slow down, you can pause for a quick break, but you cannot and you will not stop until you achieve your goal. Men offer you this same, the exact same advice this morning. The motto of the first unit that I was assigned to when I first joined the military, the 160th Night Stock, the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment Night Stalkers, uh, airborne, was NSDQ. That stands for Night Stalkers Don't Quit. I often thought of this during my daunting five-week green platoon. It's their version of assessment, where you spend six days a week on minimal sleep, doing everything from running with telephone poles to advanced firearm training and even basic EMT training. You cannot quit, men. You will set yourself apart from your peers by doing something as simple as making goals, lofty goals, and then do everything you can to obtain them. One of the things I enjoy about CrossFit, other than picking heavy things up and putting them down, is uh, a lot of the mental mindset it gives to those who participate. The exact could be said for many other sports that uh, a lot of you are involved in, and not to discount any other of those, um, but I remember as I was going to the bathroom one time in a CrossFit gym in Houston, Texas some years ago, there was a sign on the wall that said, I will run 
If I cannot run, I will walk. If I cannot walk, I will rest, and I will try again tomorrow. I spent 368 days deployed to Operation Iraqi Freedom from February of 2005 to March of 2006. I flew over 550 combat hours in an Apache longboat, pulled the trigger dozens of times, and watched the sun set and the sun rise from 100 feet over Baghdad, and sometimes in the same flight more than I once remember, all by the tender age of 23. There were plenty of times that I wanted to quit, not only go back to my FOB, which is a Ford operating base where you keep all your stuff, um, but I wanted to go back home to my love, a beautiful southern girl I had married and been with only two months prior to my deployment. And not only did I have an obligation to fill, but I had told my fellow brothers that I was going to be there and to help defend them, a calling that I was going to do or I was going to die trying. So instead of telling a yarn about some crazy story that happened to me, it's always best, I think, to talk about other people. So this, well, that, that's me, that's Veterans Day 2005. There's my lovely wife, she's in the front seat. And men, uh, this advice was given to me a long time ago, never pass up an opportunity to thank your wife um, when that happens. So thank you, honey, and you're the reason that I'm here. This picture here is of a man named, uh, at the time, Captain Dan. He's now, I believe, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dan Anderson of the California National Guard. Kind of a bad lighting, but there's him with the governor a couple weeks ago. He's a pretty cool cat. I have to share this story with you about being a man of your word and not quitting. I realize that many of you may be struggling to find the similarities between combat and life as a young man, especially one in high school, farm country, Maryland. Um, and as we heard, make no mistake, this world owes you nothing. Life outside, or freedom as we just heard, inside your own home, is just as dangerous and even more unforgiving as combat. You will face struggles and hardships that no amount of mom's cookies can fix. You'll reach a point in your life when you have to attack those challenges head on. And I know the iPhone 6 and 6S and Plus, whatever else they got now, has a lot of different options, but life gives you two options. Either you run to your goal, if you can't run, you walk. If you can't walk to your goal, you crawl. If you can't crawl, you rest and try again tomorrow. Now back to story number 32. On a late afternoon in 2005, in August, a friend of mine, Dennis Hay, was piloting an OH-58D uh, Kiowa Warrior. It's a two-seat helicopter with some guns, and they often fly with doors off so their hair can blow the wind and everything. Um, he was flying a patrol over the town of Talafar, Iraq, in the Nineveh province. For you history buffs, um, this is the same region that Jonah was commanded to go to before the big fish swallowed him up in the Old Testament. Dennis was shot, in the sniper by, uh, was shot by a sniper in the neck, and his uh, co-pilot was shot through both legs. His co-pilot was able to limp the, ailing, the failing helicopter to the ground in between two Humvees. As Dennis lay on the ground bleeding from the shot in his neck, a very close friend of mine, Captain Dan, got the medevac call. And he was the medevac commander, and he heard that Dennis was dying only a four-minute flight away. He was also told the LZ was too hot for extraction, meaning that for him to land there was probably going to be at his own risk. Captain Dan told the soldiers on the end of the radio that he'd be there in five minutes. He gathered his flight crew, started his Black Hawk, and began his journey. As he began to make his approach to what was considered a hot LZ, the helicopter began to take fire. Captain Dan felt bullets hitting the bottom of his seat, and even so close that it grazed his right leg and took off uh, his... Uh, pistol that was on his hip holster. Captain Dan did a go around during which he looked at his crew and said, we have to go get these guys. Captain Dan made another approach, the same result of the enemy fire made to the ground successfully this time. The ground crew loaded Dennis on the helicopter and the co-pilot and Dan took off and flew back to the airfield. As he made the approach, he knew the situation was extremely critical. Instead of landing the helicopter on the pads, he asked that traffic be stopped on the road so that he could land a short 30 seconds closer to the medevac station. I remember standing next to the helicopter as the sun was setting and stopping traffic so that Captain Dan's helicopter could land with Dennis on there, on board. Dennis lost the fight that night, and uh, Captain Dan still is and was a man of his word. 
No matter how hard it was going to be or how much it might cost him, he was going to, be, he was going to do the job that he was asked to do. Courage and strength that it takes to fly a helicopter into a firestorm of bullets isn't something that manifests itself in times of need. No men, this type of moral fiber is worn, woven together at an early age, at your age. Now I know you've heard it before, but you, but who you are is not what we see. But you're the person that happens behind closed doors. I did not misspeak. The person you truly are is the person you are behind closed doors. Man, this is a daunting task in today's age. Behind closed doors, in front of your computer screen, with your girlfriend when no one else is around, when you see money lying around, when the liquor cabinet's unlocked, when you have the answers but you didn't work for them. These moments are the little times in your life that will define you. Sure, you'll have huge milestones, and people will know you, your successes, and in my case, oftentimes failures. But don't let those things define you. Let who you are define you. If you want to celebrate diversity, be a man of courage, a man of integrity, because I'm telling you right now, those are in rare form in today's day. Do not let pity things that no one has real control over influence your prejudices, like someone's skin color, social status, or even religion. Someone has as much control over who their parents are, the color of their skin, than you do over the weather. Don't let them define how you treat them. Don't ever use your social status, your skin color, or upbringing as an excuse for your behavior. And furthermore, don't let it define you. Disrespecting the other human being is unwarranted no matter where you or they may be from. Please make no mistake this morning about me. I'm a man that has failed in life over and over again. I've struggled with addiction, poor choices, slanderous tongue, and pride, just to name a few. But as I often told an old friend of mine who beats himself up about choices that he's made, don't let the mistake define you, but make who you are after that mistake define you. Now, I hope I haven't gone all Billy Madison on you and you're all dumber for listening to me at no point in time is there any point to my incoherent rambling. But as I wind this up, I'd like to take a play from the old Mark Twain playbook here and leave you with several pieces of advice. I'll expound on them a little bit more than you did, though. On spending money, men, there's a few things to skimp on money when buying. Underwear is not one of them. <laughs> you can buy something kind of nice twice or something nice and of good quality once. Choose wisely. That's me and my brother. <laughs> it's a toga party, Korea, plum story. There's me and my youngest son. Be humble, men. Everyone you meet from the wealthy individual driving the 5 Series to the homeless man on that intersection doing something you cannot, they all know something that you don't. I was once in Denver with some constituents from work. We were driving to our hotel and we passed by a man who was uh, panhandling for money on the side of the highway. And one of my friends said in a sly comment, I wonder what he did to end up there. It sank into me, and about 10 minutes later, almost bawling, I called my dad. <laughs> And in telling him the story and acknowledging that I was only one bad decision away from being in that man's shoes. And not only by God's grace, I was able to live the life that I have. One of the, greats you can, one of the greatest traits in life you can have, men, is humility. And when you seek it out, it's a much easier lesson learned than when it seeks you out. Pace yourself. And everything from a gallon of milk challenge, the pursuit of higher education, to a relationship with a significant other. Drink life in moderation, you'll find yourself drowning in it. Enjoy the ride. You'll never have the kind of freedoms in life that you do right now. I look back at my year and a half in flight school, and my flight instructors used to tell us in primary, it's the portion of the flight school where you learn how to just fly a helicopter. And uh, they tell you, you know, relax, have fun, but I was always too worried about making the grade and making a good impression that I never um, just sat back and, it, figuratively speaking, enjoyed the ride. I was too worried about making grades and being a professional. I miss those days. Be at the right place at the right time with the right uniform. You will surpass 90% of your peers by just following this simple rule. Be on time where you need to be and have everything with you to work or to learn. Regardless of the job that you do, you will surpass 90% of your peers in life by following those three simple rules.
Be honest. Sometimes tactfully honest, but be honest. Once again, being known as a man for honesty will not only make you a minority in life, but it will be one of those traits that will help you succeed in the corporate world. You will fail, and in the end, you'll have no one to blame for your failures but yourself. When you fail, the first thing you need to do is to identify what happened. And to try again, don't blame other people for your shortcomings in planning, preparation, or execution in life. This is probably my favorite. Number eight, surround yourself with like-minded people. The people you identify with now and the habits you form in life will follow you, and I'm only speaking from experience, at least until you're 33, and I'm sure some of the old crusty teachers in here will back me up on this one. The people you surround yourself with, if they have bad habits, guess what? You're gonna develop bad habits. Although conversely, if you surround yourself with goal-oriented people who make positive choices and somewhat challenge you, chances are, chances of you being dragged down are much lower. If the people you're surrounding yourself with don't have your best interests in mind, they're not your friends. Be kind. Nothing good will ever come when you lose your temper. Trust me on this one. Nothing. Be kind to everyone you interact with. You will be a minority if you do this. Just please, take more time in your daily interactions to be kind, put your phone down, look people in the eye, and be kind. It's too easy to do the right thing. I often tell my coworkers about a game I play when I'm faced with a questionable moral decision. I like to play a game of good idea, bad idea. Some of you may have heard me say that. Oftentimes, the few extra minutes it takes to do something right or make the right choice will trump the consequences that might happen if you fail or get caught. And then I stand here today looking back on my last year of my life. In the last year, I've seen two friends be put in the grave, watched someone close to me battle addiction, and several marriages fail. I'm 33 years old, barely twice as old as most of you in this room. And there's no easy button on life. Tragedy knows no bounds, and it will come knocking on your door when you least expect it. How you react to them will show your worth as a man, not the college you go to, not the car you drive, or how much money you have in your bank account. I want to thank you all for letting me bend your ears this morning. You're all amazing men with everything in life they could ever want to do or see ahead of you. Don't let anyone ever tell you that you cannot do something. If you have a goal in life and someone tells you no, as one of my best friends and boss at work says, let no be the start of that conversation. I'm very proud to be here amongst you. You're all our amazing men with the world in front of you, of which I'm extremely jealous. Remember, men, if you can't run, walk. If you can't walk, crawl. If you can't crawl, rest and try again tomorrow. Thank you.